Welcome to Think Tank. I'm Steve Adubato. We are honored to be joined here in the studio by United States Congressman Frank Pallone. He is the chairman of the House Energy and Commerce Committee, representing the 6th Congressional District. You're ranking where in seniority in the House right now? I'm guessing, but I, would, I think like maybe 14th or something like that. How long have you been there? 30, it'll be 32 years in November. Will you even admit that we served in a legislature together in the mid-80s? I admit all the time, but when people <laughs> ask me how many years I've been in Congress, oftentimes I'll try to avoid the question. <laughs> <laughs> I hear you. Listen, Congressman, let's get right into some major issues. Um, the Clean Air Act versus, the, excuse me, the Clean Future Act versus the New Green Deal, because it's a big issue for you, the environment, uh, global warming. What is the Clean Future Act, and how is it different from the New Green Deal? Go. Well, what happened is when the Democrats took over the majority last year in the 2018? House. 2018? Right. We decided that it was very important to address climate change. And as you may or may not know, for the eight years when we were not in the majority in our committee, which has most of the jurisdiction over these issues, uh, the Republicans would never allow a hearing uh, on the issue. Of course, you could debate it and bring it up because it's a free country, but never a hearing, nothing formal, so to speak. So um, there's not, in my opinion, there's not much difference between the Green New Deal and the Clean Future Act in the sense that both trying to address climate. Um, the one thing that people make a big deal about is that we use the, um, the deadline of 2050 because that's what the UN says and most of the scientists say, if you don't address this by then, we're going to have a major you know, catastrophe. Uh, the Green New Deal says that, you know, we should use a deadline of 2030, which is nine years away. To do but, what? Well, the, the, it, let me explain that you could use the Clean Future Act and do it quicker if you had the political will and the votes to do that. So I don't think there's that much of a difference. But to do what? Well, let me give you an example. You go sector by sector. So one is the power sector, right? In the power sector, we said you have to have net zero emissions by 2050, which means that you know, you can use a combination of renewables or carbon capture or whatever, but you can't have any additional uh, greenhouse gases emitting into the atmosphere. And then you, similar for the transportation sector, right? You have to have, you know, fuel, more fuel efficient uh, vehicles, or you have to have electric vehicles. Or for the industrial sector, you have to manufacture things without, you know, putting more greenhouse gases into the Is the, the goal atmosphere. to get rid of all carbon emissions? It, that's not the goal, but it could get to that point. Uh, you could certainly achieve it by having none. But no, this is uh, a, a, a no increase. In other, in other words, uh, uh, net zero emissions, meaning no additional carbon into the atmosphere. How would you rate and how would you describe President Trump's efforts in this regard? He's totally opposite. I mean, one of the things I, I keep stressing to people, Steve, is that let's not talk about the difference between, you know, what Democrats or what progressives believe because the president and the Republican leadership in Congress don't even acknowledge that climate change is real. And so our battle is to convince our Republican colleagues that they should join us in this effort. Otherwise, it's not likely to happen because, you know, we continue to have divided government. So what is, in fact, in your opinion, again, I often say we don't do politics, we do policy, but politics is connected to policy. What is at stake in the 2020 election as it relates to climate change? Well, I obviously would like to see a Democratic president, a Democratic Senate, and an, an all-Democratic Washington, because then when it comes to climate change, we would actually be able to address it. What about the need for bipartisan government? Well, absent that, um, then you'd have to try to convince enough Republicans to go along with some of these things. And some of them they are willing to go along with. Like, for example, energy efficiency is something that they're... You know, you could say, let's work towards this goal without your acknowledging that uh, these carbon emissions or this climate change is human-induced, because that's what they'll say. Many of my colleagues on the Republican side, well, I'll work with you on climate change, but I don't believe it's human-induced. Well, that makes it a little difficult, but you can, you know say, okay, let's move towards renewables, let's move towards energy efficiency, but it's gonna be harder to achieve, but you can do those things. And we have done some things, even in this Congress on a bipartisan basis, on things like energy efficiency. Before we move to healthcare, I'm curious about something. What do you truly believe, after serving more than a few years in government, living down at the Jersey Shore, seeing what you see there, after Hurricane, uh, Superstorm Sandy, et cetera, what do you truly believe is at stake for our nation and civilized society. I, I hate to be so grandiose, but that is what I mean when it comes to climate change. What's at stake? 
Well, I don't like to talk in terms of catastrophic events because then people kind of, they tune out. Why? Because they don't like to believe that it's at that stage. What do you believe? Oh, I think it is. But I think even if you don't agree with that, or even if you don't agree that it's human-induced, at least join together and try to address it in some meaningful fashion. Are we losing precious time? Oh, absolutely, sure. I mean, most, uh, most people say, most scientists say that this problem is more acute in New Jersey than it is in the rest of the country. And we're seeing the sea level rise, and we're seeing all kinds of problems in our state. Shift gears. By the sure. way, listening on the audio side, United States Congressman Frank Pallone from the uh, 6th Congressional District. He is the chair of the House Energy and Commerce Committee. Talk to us about pharmaceutical drug prices. Well, drug prices increasingly are a big reason why health care costs are going up, right? And both uh, Trump and, uh, and Hillary, when they ran in 2016, said they wanted to have negotiated prices. And so I have a bill called H.R. 3, which passed the House of Representatives. House Resolution Number 3. Right, which passed, and we're hoping that we can get some action in the Senate, that basically says that the government will negotiate prices with the pharmaceutical manufacturers to bring costs down. Now, keep in mind that every developed country in the world does this, Japan, Canada, Australia, all of Western Europe, and that's why drug prices are, on average, uh, you know, at least half the cost they are here, sometimes 25%. And in Medicare... Uh, Part D, when it was established, is a clause that says you cannot not negotiate prices. The government can't do it. So we have to repeal that, set up a mechanism where we have the government negotiate with the drug manufacturers. How cooperative has the pharmaceutical industry been in this regard? They oppose it, but in all honesty, Steve, you know, you were in the assembly. You know, they don't oppose it uh, as much as you might think. Um, so I think they recognize that, you know, this is likely to happen. Um, but um, they're not. Why is it likely to happen? Because there's bipartisan cooperation and support? Yeah, I mean, it's hard. You know, so far, McConnell has not been willing to go this route. But the president says he wants to. But he has been pushing hard enough. But I do think maybe as we get close to the election, or obviously if Trump is defeated, uh, I think we will get it. We will we'll pass it. There are Republicans who would support us. You know, you've been a leading person on a lot of issues, Congressman. But when it comes to the larger health care uh, issue and, and the Affordable Care Act and the effort that some say the Trump administration has been engaged in dismantling largely through the courts. Yes, right? but not just through the courts, Steve. He does a lot with agency action, too, to dismantle Th Describe it. that for people, because people think, well, it would take Congress to have to do something. You're saying through executive order he's done what? Through what agencies to achieve what impact? Well, I'm going to give you an example, right? One of the things that um, was very important in the ACA was, the Affordable Care Act, Obamacare. Was the Affordable Care, Care Act, or Ob I'll use Obamacare if you want, is uh, an essential benefits package. In other words, that your health insurance covers things that are important, right? Obviously, hospitalization, whatever. So one of the things he's done is to have these executive orders that say you can uh, sell junk plans in the Obamacare marketplace, which don't cover a lot of these things. And so people sign up for it, and then they find out that their health care is not covered. Is pre 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 Existing conditions covered? Well, he says in theory that you can't discriminate based on pre-existing conditions, but let's use this example. So you have a pre-existing condition and you buy a junk plan that doesn't cover something that you need. Well, then you don't have coverage. But why would the president, why would the president want to do that, Congressman? Because it's cheaper, in other well, words. But hold on, respectfully. Why would the president want to do that when a significant number of his supporters and a large number of states with working class people, people who are struggling to try to afford health insurance. When I say working class, what I mean by that is they are not super rich. They are working class, middle class. Some have jobs, some don't. But they're all struggling with health care costs. Why would he do that if those are the constituents who in many cases support him in key battleground states? It's illogical. Well, I mean, you can take a cynical approach and say there's some special interest involved, but what I really think it is, is that is ideological. In other words, why should you force someone to have a, 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 a good package if they can find a package that, that doesn't cover a lot well, of What is cheaper? the answer to that? Why should the government force that? Well, because the problem is people don't know it, right? They sign up for these junk plans. They think it covers them, and, and, they, and it doesn't. I mean, in other words, if you take the attitude that everybody's going to be this educated consumer and, uh, you know, look at all the fine print and know exactly what they're mm -hmm. buying, but it's not true, Steve. 
It's just not the case. We're speaking to United States Congressman Frank Pallone. Uh, one more health care related issue. You concerned about the vaping crisis? Yes, in fact, that bill, my bill, is coming up this week. What, should, what is the bill, and how is this a national issue? Well, what we found is that more and more young people, and I say young, these are kids under 21 who can't buy right. any tobacco product, maybe in 6th, 7th, 8th grade, they start vaping because, they, because it has all these flavors, bubble gum, whatever, and they're convinced by the advertising on TV that it's a smoking cessation and they're not going to that doesn't have nicotine and not gonna get addicted. And so what we're saying is that we want e-cigarettes to, to be deemed a tobacco product by the FDA, which they're not, that's what the bill says. And then you can't have the advertising that you see on TV that you're not allowed to do for cigarettes. Where is that bill now? It's gonna come up on the House floor. President Trump supporting it? President Trump has basically through executive order done something much weaker, okay? Will he support this legislation? I think he probably would if it come to, came to his desk, but then it has to also be, uh, you know, get through the Senate. Got to move through the Senate. Yeah. Now, I mean, I didn't give you all the details. Two seconds, go ahead. It also outlaws the flavors, right? And it outlaws right. o online Which sales. has been done in New Jersey as well. Yeah, New Jersey is pretty much similar. Uh, not completely, not, not as strong, but it is like 80, 90 percent of what we're trying to do. You've been listening to United States Congressman Frank Pallone, the chairman of the House Energy and Commerce Committee. Um, Thank you, Congressman, for joining us on Think Tank. We Thank greatly you, appreciate Steve. it. Good to see you again. Same here. I'm Steve Adubato. We'll be right back right after this. Think Tank with Steve Adubato has been a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation. Funding has been provided by Atlantic Health System, Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, Investors Bank, Gibbons PC, NJM Insurance Group, New Jersey Sharing Network, Operating Engineers, Local 825, the Healthcare Foundation of New Jersey, and by IBEW Local 102. Promotional support provided by NorthJersey.com and Local IQ. And by Meadowlands Chamber. Transportation provided by Airbrook Limousine, serving the metropolitan New York, New Jersey area.